All right, so we're going to be exploring chapter three today. Uh, yesterday in lab, we just used Packet Tracer to understand DHCP. And I told you DHCP was an application layer protocol. Uh, it offers us an automation service. And that is, anytime a new computer is introduced to that network that has a DHCP service running on it, will be assigned an IP address, right? Yeah, DHCP, that's Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol. So when our computers boot up, they're brand new to a network, the DHCP server will fulfill that request, offer them an address. Can anybody remind me what the four steps in this process of getting an automated IP address? Request. First step is the request from the client, right? The offer. The offer. So the server says, mm -hmm. try this. Why is, why is it called the offer and not just use it? Yeah, because remember at this given point that computers don't have IP addresses, so everything's being broadcast. So there could be another computer on the network that's going through the same process of getting a new IP address. And it says, hey, that's what I wanted. Thank you for that. And so it's a first come, first serve kind of deal. And so we have a race condition. So the second step is we offer it. And we offer it to anybody that's actually looking for an IP address. This is why DHCP uses two different port addresses, 67 and 68. One for sending, one for receiving. So what's the third step? Yeah, the, uh, the uh, like sort of like, OK. Yeah, acknowledgment. There we go. I like that one better. So it's like, OK, here I'm acknowledging that you're taking this offer. I would like this. So the client's coming back saying, I would like it. And then the last step is it's yours, the guaranteed, right? The promise. So those are the four in DHCP. Remember, we're dealing with layer seven application. Can you guys tell me some other application layer protocols? Ah, thank you, because that's where we're going to be going to today. So you guys just mentioned DHCP, and then somebody said email. Well, email comes in all different flavors. You got it. We have POP, so that's the post office protocol. We have SMTP, which is the simple mail transfer protocol. What else do, could we have? What about this one? This one's becoming increasingly popular. And the reason why it's becoming increasingly popular, that is the IMAP protocol. Yeah, it's, well, it's sort of like a hybrid of both the old traditional way of doing email and today's web-based mail. And that is, we can access our web mail through our MUA. Now, an MUA is called a mail user agent. It's a generic word because today we access email through all kinds of devices. Hell, even my alarm clock accesses my email. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody got it for me for Christmas, a little Sony Dash, and it's... Uh, internet ready obviously and every morning when I wake up it just tells me how many emails I have in my inbox um, it's one of those things I tell you guys check your things every day that's just a way for me to do it um, but it's this concept of email being accessed from anything and so that anything that we use to access emails called an MUA a mail user agent you being the user is using this particular device to access it but we're finding that email is better if it's stored centrally and left there so that we can access it from anywhere. Traditionally, we used to download email to a PC. And the only way we can access that email was if we're at that PC. So now with this protocol, we're saying, hey, access it. Acknowledge that it's been read. So remove it out of the inbox as brand new so that when you access it from your phone or your tablet or your TV or whatever other device, it won't keep on coming up at each device as being brand new. Make sense? Whereas before, the way people used to access email and had multiple copies of it was they would leave it on the server, copy it onto this client, then access it from another client and copy it. And each time they would do this, it would always be marked as brand new. So this feature makes it real handy because it sort of synchronizes your email across all devices. And folks, there are more protocols out there for email. These are just the popular ones. Now, protocols assign port addresses to the communication. Port address for POP is going to be 110. 
This is me leading into chapter four. We'll be exploring this next week. SMP is going to be 25. Now, I haven't committed to memory what IMAP is, but if you guys want, you can always Google IMAP and then type in port addresses. And it'll be interesting to see. But for the two that we're going to be learning today, you have them, 110 and 25. Now remember, this is at that segment layer, which is layer five, sorry, layer four. We're going to skip, we're not even going to get there yet. That's going to be next week. What I'd like to talk about today is exactly what happens on the client computer when they want to send an email to the friend. And so the client's going to be using an MUA. Folks, this course is like the alphabet soup course when it comes to computers. There's nothing but anagrams all the time and acronyms. So here we have MUA, as I said, male user agent. I have to drill that into, especially if you're watching my PowerPoint presentation, because I'm constantly saying MUA, MTA, MDA, and it goes on and on and on. And if those aren't clicking in, you're going to be lost just in the letters itself. So the male user agent is software. Now we call this an application because it's running on the client. Even if you're using your cell phone to access like your Gmail account. Devin, focus up here, please. Sorry, we're not using the computers right now. Thank you. Appreciate that. Even if we're using software. I mean, even if we're using our iPhones to access our email, we must have some kind of application installed on this, correct? We're simply calling these apps, so we'll keep that tradition going. And that app is going to have to talk to an email server. This connection between the client and the server, we've been calling this the client-server model, can work both ways. A stream going up and a stream coming down. If I am sending an email, obviously I'll be using the upload stream. If I'm receiving an email, I'll be using the download stream. You guys should feel really comfortable by now because you've been uploading and downloading files throughout the last X number of years of your life. However, what I'm going to do is spice it up. If I am sending an email, I'm going to be sending it to my email server using SMTP. Like I said, it's a simple mail transfer protocol. If I am downloading email, my email server using an MDA, mail delivery agent, along with POP, the post office protocol, will place that email in my inbox. Now, notice I said downloading it. With IMAP, you really don't download, but rather you view it from the server. However, in order for you to see it on your screen, it has to be downloaded, correct? Usually stored on a local cache. And then when you get done viewing it, it might clear out when your cache fills up. You don't have direct access. You just put it in this MDA, and this MDA will then send the data that you're reading. And when you're done with it, it'll erase it. If you're using map, IMAP. If you're using POP, it is truly downloaded, and it is stored locally. Now, I say this because we have to be careful. Some professor in Mansfield lost their job over this because of inappropriate communications, things that were sent via his email. And they were being downloaded and stored one time. And they went to go repair their, his, his laptop because he was having some kind of problem, getting a virus, people wondering why. And so they stumbled across his inbox that was stored. He thought he deleted everything but his messages were saved in this reserved area of the operating system, and they opened them up and found things that weren't appropriate. Regardless of what your profession, the material wasn't appropriate. So things are stored regardless. On the client side, that's how we view it. Web pages are stored in your history, folks. You know this. 
you guys clear it out. Any protocol you guys are using to send and receive, whatever it is, whether it's email, web pages, are going to transfer it to you locally. It might be stored temporarily so that you can access it without monopolizing the server. This is where things get a little bit trickier. And this is where things get complex. This email server probably going to have a bunch of other clients related to it. That's assuming if what? They all have the same ending, if you will, the same domain name. Email has an interesting structure. It's the username followed by an at symbol, then the domain name. And by the way, servers can have multiple donate, sorry, domain names associated with it. Corning only has one. In fact, we have our email server probably right there behind that whiteboard on the other side of the hallway. And the whole world can access our servers. And we actually have a server room on the second floor, somewhere in the middle of the building. Uh, it's the only room on campus that's air conditioning. And so here, you and I, and anybody else that has a corning-cc.edu email address is associated with that particular server. If I want to send something to you using SMTP, I'll leave my client computer, go to the server, and this server is going to be looking at this part of the address and make a decision. That is, do I need to be forwarding it to another email server, or is this user on my list of clients? In this particular case, they are. So what the email server will do, using an MTA, a mail transfer agent, will take that email and pass it to the MDA, the mail delivery agent. You might say, well, why the hell doesn't it just go from the client to the email server, then right to the person who's supposed to receive it? The thing that they've been driving at to you guys in chapter three is the client initiates the data exchange. The client is the one responsible for saying, hey, give me data, I'm making a request. The MTA cannot be sitting and waiting for these clients to say, send me my email. The MTA says, look, I'm going to give it to this particular service, and then when this person logs in and they ask for email, you can deliver it because I have other important things to be doing. What if the email isn't destined for a client that's stored locally? How does it know which one to look at first? What do you mean? Like you said it looks at Corning first, or how does it know? You said they get a, the server could handle different uh, domain names. Yeah, exactly. And know? so if I configure my email server, I'll say you need to check for this domain name, I'll you need to check for that thing. domain name. So it'll go through it step by step. It'll open up an email saying, okay, this is the recipient. It's at corning-cc.edu. Now let me go to my list and see if that's one of my domain names I'm responsible for. I gotcha. Now, if it says Hotmail, I don't know if they even use that anymore. But if it does, then this email server is going to say, I don't have that. I'm going to pass it using MTA to another email server. How does the MTA deliver this email that you're sending to somebody at Hotmail? It too uses SMTP. And what do you think happens at this email server? What's the very first step when an email comes into a server? Checks it. Checks what? The domain name. Checks the domain name. And what's it checking for? It's the Whether the client that you are sending the email to is on, 
is a recipient of this server, right? If it's yes, what's going to happen? It's going to check the What's that? And then if it's yes, and they find the person on the list of clients, it'll go to the mail delivery agent. And then what happens next? It's not delivered to the client. It sits there, and it waits until when? Until the client initiates the conversation, correct? Mm -hmm. Saying, hey, do I have any mail? This is you guys logging in, checking on a daily basis. What if it doesn't have that client as a recipient? It sends it out the MTA. No. Using the MTA along with, SMTP. you got it as the protocol, to another email server. And this process goes on and on and on until we either find it or it just said, hey, I've exploited 25 email servers. I'm done looking. This person doesn't exist. And that all happens in microseconds or all depends on the, uh, the connection, the bandwidth between them. Then the MDA, if it does find the user eventually using POP, will deliver it to the client, but the client has to initiate the conversation. Question? So email does have a hot count before it finally dies? Uh, depending on the protocols that you are using, it, yeah, they don't call it a hop count, but yes, it does. Yep, it'll say, uh, have you ever received a message from when you tried emailing somebody and they didn't that's exist? That's it'll say, uh, number of such and such has expired or reached the maximum number of attempts. And that's exactly right, just like a, a routing update. Does the administrator um, um, control the, the account? Uh, no, that's going to be done through this protocol. This protocol is saying, look, uh, we can't be having these emails just wandering around aimlessly across the internet and tying up all this bandwidth. So that protocol established the rule and saying that you're allowed 25 attempts. And you can't reach an email server within 25 attempts, then we are going to just ignore and no, no longer, well actually destroy the email and then send back a message to the person who originally tried sending it informing them that the recipient could find, could be found or the number of attempts have been exceeded. Is there a standard or anything like that? So it does That's what the protocol does. Okay. Th that's why we have protocols. So it standardizes it so that if you are a developer or a network administrator, you you'll know, know what that is okay. and then you can either process, sorry, do the troubleshooting. Because what if this email server goes down? Mm -hmm. Well, it's not in series like this. Later we start getting into WANs, you'll understand that it doesn't have to be just that email server. It could go to another email server, eventually hoping that it connects. Well, and you're actually going to see that in my DNS example that we're going to do right after this. Any other questions? These are great questions, folks. It helps iron out this detail. There's a lot of like step-by-step -step approaches to understanding that. But you're starting to see how protocols are critical in the communication process because, one, it standardizes the message. Why am I using SMTP? Very common, very well-known protocol. In fact, it's one of the original email protocols, so it's very polished. And that means these email servers understand that message format. They know where to go to look for the, des the uh, recipient, the person receiving the email. They constantly research it. You said POP and SMTP are the, mo are mo the most common ones. Mm -hmm. The I I I IMAP. IMAP is kind of new. Yeah, it's fairly new, yep. It's been a uh, product. going to be more down the road. Oh, absolutely. Oh, yeah. Yep. I think the way we handle email is going to be different. I think it's going to be more of a video mailing service, and the way we interact with each other is going to be an all new scale. Text and messaging, that's not going to go anywhere. In fact, people used to think instant messages is going to be destroyed with SMS, right? Your simple text messages that you guys send to each other with your mm -hmm. phones. Uh, we need some form of text messaging, but I think as computers become more and more intelligent and uh, we move away from actual manual inputting with keyboards and mice and touching screens and we go into like voice uh, narrations where they pick up our voice and digitize it and then convert it into text or whatever the case may be, you'll find that everything will be changed. And that's why our communication process is beautiful. The OSI model has never changed. It's so flexible that they can allow this new form of technology without breaking down the network or requiring a huge change in the network. Those are pretty expensive. I, I, I once saw a blind man that was talking. He couldn't use his computer. 
computer, but he was talking to it and got his email and everything. Yep. Because he's totally blind. Yep. And we're going to find our devices are going to be recording. I mean, look at our, sm our smartphones. They're becoming even more powerful that they're going to be integrated with everything that we do. Uh, where we're at, our conversations that we have might be recorded, whether it's video, voice, um, and might even be transcripted to a text-based communication. But regardless, we're finding that people are not reading like they used to. So Big Brother is going to get bigger, too, right? Yeah. Yep. But beyond the scope, the nice thing about it, though, is it ties back to these protocols and how we set up rules to allow for this new form of technology to change the way we communicate. In fact, does anybody watch uh, Person of Interest, CBS? Yes. If you're a computer person, you might enjoy that. And that is, uh, they have that Big Brother theory going for them really well. And in throughout that show, they're logged into uh, like New York's uh, closed circuit TVs. So, and in there, there's this server is just so intelligent that it can do facial recognition and then trace somebody as they go from camera to cam camera and find them where they're at. Really interesting stuff. In fact, they did a uh, interview with the uh, creator of the show, Jonathan Nolan, which you guys know from the Batman series. Well, Vegas uh, has the same thing because they do that. Yeah, on yeah. That. And that's what they referenced it, and they said this, this technology is actually existent and it is working. It's just not as fast or uh, dependable as it is in these TV shows. But it is going to be the way we conduct, you know, our business in the future. So one thing to follow through. So we did DHCP yesterday. We just got done going over email. Do you guys feel pretty comfortable with email process? I'm bringing this up because of this week's assessment. Cisco drills this process. There's like five questions on this email. And I always say to myself, why the hell are they asking our network fundamental students to know this process? And the only justification I can give you guys is simply it's showing you these protocols in action. It's a real example, and it's ask, making you guys ask these right questions. And that is, well, what about this? What about that? How is this working? And it all stems on these protocols. Another well-known service that we take for granted is DNS. I mentioned this as being like the internet phone book. And how does a phone book work traditionally? We take a person's name, like John Doe. We look them up, hopefully we find them, and right across from their name is a phone number. Why do I care about a phone number? Yeah, I'm going to try to do another form of communication. I wrote the person an email, he hasn't responded, so now I'm going to go find his name, and, uh, sorry, find his number in a phone book and call him up. Yet another form of communication. and. Uh, why can't I just pick up my phone and say John Doe? I mean, wouldn't that be really nice? What's wrong Too with that? John Does. Too many John Does? Yeah, yeah. What else is wrong with that? What's that? Yeah, but that's the thing though. I mean, I don't want it on my phone, remember. We're trying to move everything to the central location so that wherever I'm at, Whatever phone I pick up, there's no code. You don't know is, is area code. You don't know. But see, that's the thing, and that's 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 the problem. We're we're still thinking back in the '80s, folks. My phone's got GPS on it. Let's make some assumptions here. Second, the processing power on my phone should be smart enough to detect my voice and realize what kind of relationships I have, especially if I have a Facebook account, and say, he must be referring to this John Doe. Right? If I pick up my phone and I say I want to talk to Evan, my phone should be smart enough to realize Evan is not a family member, but I can check his student rosters because he stores all of his files on a cloud. This might be the Evan you want and says, are you looking for this particular Evan? And I can say, no, I'm looking for Evan that lives in Corning. And they're like, well, the only Evan that we think that you know that lives in Corning is this, according to your Facebook, according to whatever. And then I could say, that's the one. 
don't have to look at anything. I'm interacting with these computers on a whole new level. I am talking. It's recognizing everything, whether it's my voice, my location, my friends and family. Question. They do now. In fact, even the new iPhone 5 that's coming out really soon, folks, doesn't do telephone the way old cell phones do now. And that is, they don't have a dedicated connection to voice services. They're using voice over IP. There's only one connection coming to your phone now, and that is an internet connection. You mean that commercial with Martin Scorsese where he says, where's so-and-so, and the phone tells him right where he yep. is? Yep. Yeah. How is it being I think done? Think about it, especially with Facebook and how it's integrating this. In fact, there's a feature on Facebook that says, share my, you're getting it all. Now, yeah, now you're seeing all this stuff come together and being like, holy shit, this is really changing it. It pulls your location up on Google Earth. And now, now you guys are saying, what if I turn off my cell phone? Hey, thank you for uploading all your pictures on Facebook. Facebook. I really appreciate oh, yeah. that because do you know how many times a day your face is taken a photo of? A photo of your face is being taken? Oh, yeah. You walk by an ATM. You walk in, yeah, walk into Walmart. It's done all the time. Where are those images being stored? Right yeah. <laughs> yeah. They're all over. Where are these images being stored? Somewhere out there. And now what can we do? All those videos that are on YouTube, we can process them. We can process them pretty fast. The NSA has some incredible equipment. Do you think there's ever, they might have it now. Is there any way they you do. take like a picture of yourself and see what videos you popped up on over YouTube? Well, see now, wouldn't that be some new technology? Yeah, Couldn't you write an app for that? You take a picture of yourself and you say, yeah, exactly right. What photos you pop up in random? Yep. Basically you playing yourself. Right? There you go. And that could be a way to protect your identity. It's like, So we see how this is really opening up this po potential and how it all stems on this network connection because these resources, once they are stored centrally, it's just a matter of getting permission to access them. And once we can access them, we can do things we never thought about doing before. And that is eliminating the phone number. Why do we have a phone number system? It's because we can create unique numbers to identify somebody, like a social security number. And so when I pick it up, you saw this hierarchy. Area code, local exchange, then the person's number. And with that, the phone system can pinpoint to a particular individual, and we can have what we call a unicast conversation, me to you, and nobody else. And I said, well, why can't we use names? Because you said it's too generic, too common. But then I'm saying, well, let's make some sense out of it. If I say Marcus, I'm referring to the Marcus in this classroom that's only a couple of feet away from me, not the Marcus that's walking down the hallway, not the Marcus that's across the campus, not the Marcus in uh, Rome. I'm talking about this Marcus and the relationship I have with Marcus. We call this vectoring relationships. And in fact, they say there's six degrees of separation, right? And we can use this type of technology to talk, to bring into what we're trying to do in the future. And that is to be connected with everything and everyone, everywhere, at any time. It's very scary stuff, but you guys have been doing it willy-nilly and never thought anything of it. Facebooking everything. So we're gonna be doing you are storing right? that. And remember Facebook introduced that timeline? And folks, when you try to remove something from Facebook, it is not deleted. This is how Facebook makes their money. They sell your information to other companies because I could be writing software like you're talking about and I could say to Facebook, could I have access to your database? And Facebook will say, yeah, for a million dollars. And I'm saying, that's pocket change because I'm gonna sell this and make trillions of dollars. Because how many people would wanna have that kind of app that can find out where they're at in the world? by just taking a picture. Right, you got it, yep. It's patented, guys. I heard it. <laughs> so with DNS, <laughs> with DNS, we take the phone book and we integrate it. So when we type in google.com, that is the domain name, our web browser will 
find out what Google's phone number, quote unquote, would be. And what do we call that? It's not a phone number, but it's a number that we use when we try to communicate with devices across networks. IP addresses. IP addresses. That's right. In fact, you guys can do this right now. I want you guys to hold your Windows key and hit the letter R. When you hit the uh, when you hold the Windows key and hit the letter R, does a little run box pop up? Yeah. All right. So type in CMD. So the first thing was the Windows key plus the letter R. Then you're going to type in CMD. Then you're going to hit enter, and you're going to be at a prompt. It's a black screen with white letters. It's going to say drive colon backslash. I want you guys to type in ping that infamous command space. And then do google.com. You'll notice you'll get replies from, and maybe some of you guys will have different addresses. I think Google begins with like 72. Is that right? Is anybody getting a reply from? 74. 74. Okay, it'll vary because they have a huge block of addresses. Oh, some of them will. It ends in 66. Yeah, do you see how this is all varying? All right, so I have 74 dot what? 125. Dot. 226. This will all vary, but what I'd like everybody to do now that you have this IP address is I want you guys to go to your favorite web browser and in the address bar type in this address 74.125.228.72. When you guys go to that address, and we'll actually talk about that later, Devin. Um, when you guys go to that address, does Google's web page show up? Yes. All right. In order for the service or even HTTP to be working, they had to first resolve, that is, to translate this name into Google's IP address. You'll notice that you guys had all varying different results. In my lab yesterday, I believe I showed you guys some web farms, and I said Google has warehouses of computers, and each of these computers will have their own IP address. And so you guys can see that Google has a whole bunch of them. And this one should take everybody to the same exact server. Yeah, there is no varying it. All right, so how does DNS work? DNS is very hierarchical. DNS is going to be stored, and it's one of the very few protocols where there's not a counter protocol. Example is with a counter protocol, you guys access the World Wide Web using a web browser. And that web browser uses HTTP. Its counter protocol, its recipient, is going to be whoops, a web service that's installed on a server that's commonly referred to as HTTPD. You might have heard me say this yesterday in class. The D is short for daemon which is another name for a service. But you see how they have recipient relationships? You use a web browser that understands HTTPD. The server uses a daemon that's running in the background to serve it. Well, when it comes to DNS, both clients and servers use the named service. And it's rather intriguing that both of them actually use the same service. I guess you could say, as you're going through the local phone book, and you can't find who you're looking for, you can actually escalate up through, go to the city phone book, go to the county phone book, go to the state phone book, and then work your way up to the national. Well, DNS is the same way. It's very hierarchical. And that is to say, the first entry, the first place that the, serve, the application is going to look, whether it's ping, web browser, or whatever the case may be, is at the client. You guys can see what's stored on your client computer by typing in at the DOS command prompt, ipconfig 
forward uh, sorry space forward slash display DNS all one word please give that a try let me know if that works you know I got all these commands in my head and trying to uh, keep track of this and did you guys get like a list of entries and they should tell you like domain names and then their IP addresses what if you try to access a website in which they cannot find the domain name in your table, in your local table? By the way, these are called resource records. So the named service looks at resource records to resolve a domain name to an IP address. The question is asked, what if my entry, that is, my uh, domain name site that I'm looking for, isn't in my local list? I want you guys to type in ipconfig and hit enter. Does it give you information about DNS information? Does it tell you a DNS address? If you don't have it there, try this command, IP config space forward slash all. All means give me all the information I have about my interface card. Do you guys have the DNS entry then? Some address like 143, is that correct? I'm not sure what it is for our network, but what is our DNS server address? Oh, okay, this one's 192.168.1.11 after this? Yep. Okay. And that's basically probably our router. And that's another entry, whether it's on our network or some other network. I must have an IP address. You can tell this is a local IP address so that this DNS server is stored locally. It's going to be another warehouse, another phone book, probably a bigger phone book, because it's going to have everybody's entries in it. And it's going to look up that name that I'm trying to resolve. If it couldn't find it at the client, it's going to look at the DNS server, my local server. And it's going to use the name service, and it's going to repeat this process. What if it can't find it there? that server is going to have an address to another server, a higher up server. And as we work our way up the ladder, these servers are going to know more because more people are connected to it. All right, so we work our way up from the bottom, starting local, and we go up level by level with the device closest to me to the next device to the next device. Why? Because this takes time and bandwidth. If I can get it locally, I don't have to bother my internet connection, and it's going to make my web page appear to load faster. But if I can't find it, I'm going to go to my next DNS server, my actual DNS server. That takes time. If I can't find it there, that server becomes the client, and it's going to make a DNS request to their DNS server. So we're working our way up this ladder. When we get to the very top, this pyramid, it's going to know about everything underneath it. We call that a top-level domain. An example of a top-level domain is .com. The DNS server that runs at that level better know about every single .com address it is. It's the very top. And we have other TDLs, like what? .org. Dot gov, dot edu, and the list goes on and on. So at this very high point, I have these other pyramids, if you will, each representing other domains, other TDLs. If they can't find it at any one of their repositories, it doesn't exist. But what if it's something that's brand new? You're creating a website, you bought an address, and you have whatever it is, uh, find me dot com 
brand new. Usually takes about 72 hours for that information to trickle all the way up through and to be spread around to the other DNS servers. And this is how that happens. When you initiate the request and your local area, your little cache, doesn't have it, it'll make a new request to your DNS server. That DNS server doesn't have it, it makes a new request to another server. That server doesn't have it, it makes a request, and it finally finds it at the fifth try. Okay? When it finds it there, that information gets passed back down to the ladder. This server will say, you know what, other people might be looking for this site, let me store it in my cache. That one's down. It'll pass it back to its client that it made the request and it says, you know what, other people might be looking for this, let me store it here. So then that gets passed down until eventually it's back to you. And what are you going to have it? It's going to be stored in your cache. That makes things work faster, but it causes a dilemma. What if you decide to move your website to another server? Because remember, these servers have IP addresses. So originally, your domain name was pointing to 1.2.3.4. 72 hours, it tripled all across the internet. But now you decided to go to a cheaper company, and now your address is 2.4.6.8. And you know what you're going to see on your web browser when you type in findme.com? Page cannot be displayed. Page cannot be found. And you're batting your head saying, wait a minute. I just paid the bill. It should be working. I was on it the other day. You don't have any association between that and the old one, right? First step, check its cache. Did it find an entry in there? The answer is yes. But the entry was pointing the wrong way gave that IP address to your web browser, your web browser put that in there, and then the server said, this page no longer exists here because you moved your files out. Now you got a lot of upset customers, and you're trying to fix this dilemma. So there's another command that you get to type to flush out your cache. Anybody want to take a guess what the command would be? There you go. Try that. Might not work on these computers. It might have to be IP config space forward slash DNS flush. But the problem is that only solves per your particular case. Oh, yeah, you, uh, does it tell you incorrect command? Flush DNS. Flush DNS. Yeah, it depends on what operating system you're using. But thanks. The issue, however, is guess what? You're doing that as a case by case by case basis and you can only do it locally. How do you inform your DNS server? Because guess what? You flush it locally. Now what's the next step it's going to do? Go to your DNS server, but guess what your DNS server has? That entry stored in it, right? Because it doesn't want to go all the way up the ladder. It stores things as it goes, and now that wrong entry is stored in there. How do you take care of that? It's out of your hands. It's not your device. It's your ISP. And if you call them up saying, could you flush your table, they're going to be like, you're out of your mind. Why would they not want to flush their table? Because it's going to take them a long time to build these entries. And this is why your DNS entries in your table and in your server's tables will expire. Maximum limit they're allowed to expire is 72 hours. This is why they say that when you add a new site, to the internet, or to the World Wide Web, it takes about 72 hours for it to be distributed across all networks. Because when it expires, the server will then go on its own to try to grab it. Do you think the server will do it during prime time? No. No, it's probably going to do it at midnight when the connections are available. Like when I upload my videos, I do it before I go to bed, so this way I'm not tying up too much of the bandwidth. Likewise, when these DNS servers distribute their information, it's probably going to happen at night. Is there anything you can do about it? Nope. Only what you can control is what's in your local area network, and that's it. So how do you circumvent this if somebody calls up? You know what your IP address is. You tell them, if you want to access my website right now, just type in 2.4.6.8, and you will have a direct path to it. 
no different than I told you guys to enter that one address for Google. And then be like, in three days, it should be up and running. What services depend on DNS? Email, ping, web browsing, even the new office programs, your cell phones. Why? Because you and I prefer names than numbers. Names are easier to work with. Is that service going to go anywhere? Nope. Will it change? It may only get better. In fact, we're starting to see things like uh, split addressing, like bit t, where it's bit.ty. I've never heard of a ty domain. So we're doing a lot of alien uh, sorry, aliases, a lot of chronological names to help tie up the whole losing the namespace. In fact, back in the 90s, it used to be big money to buy up all these domain names before companies went on to the web, like Pepsi.com, Nike.com, uh, even like the trademark JustDoIt.com. In fact, um, where I used to work at, uh, <laughs> I was doing construction, and we were building this guy's million-dollar mansion. And I was just curious, because when I met this millionaire, he came out with a wife beater shirt, dirty boxers, and one of those beer helmet things. And this is no lie. Yeah. <laughs> and he's got his beer in there and straw coming to his mouth, scratching himself. And I'm just like, I'm all concerned, because we're building a million dollar home for this guy. And I'm like, does he have the money? Yeah. <laughs> or. Did he win the lottery? I mean, how did somebody <laughs> like him get this money? And so I was curious. I was, you know, 16 years old. There wasn't a regulator on my mouth. And I said to him, I go, did you hit the lottery or something? He goes, no, man. This is what I did. I went and bought all those 900 numbers, but I made dot coms out of them. So you guys use your imagination. You know, when you're a kid, 1-900, something, something, something. Well, remove the 1-900 and just that something, something, put a dot .com after it. And he goes, boy, when the internet took off, what was the number one thing that was driving traffic? Pornography. And what do you think people wanted? Something, something, dot .com. And so they had to buy it from me. I owned it. I didn't have a website. And I sold it to them for thousands and thousands of dollars, and it only cost me dollars to buy these domains. Sounds like somebody I know. Yeah, it might be. <laughs> <laughs> and so this guy made a boatload of money off of this stuff, and then other people tried doing this. I mean, we're talking about the peak, uh, just of the internet boom. And uh, they tried doing it just, no, no, Philadelphia. <laughs> this person was, uh, you know, trying just do it, Nike and Pepsi, and then these companies are like, no way. We have this trademarked. We spent X number of dollars to have a business license. You cannot take our company name and buy it out from us and make it .com. And those companies won those cases. But you can take a phrase, something, something, something .com, whatever it is, buy it. And if a company really wants it, they'll offer you a lot of money for it. Why? Because back then, it was hard trying to find resources. So we did things off of names. In fact, you used to get in trouble going to dicks.com. It wasn't Dick's Sporting Goods. And yeah. people weren't used to using Google or you, uh, sorry, uh, Yahoo. All right? You guys take care. I will see you uh, next Monday. Remember.